For those around during last year's Tech Talk, you might remember me introducing object-oriented I.O. This follows the same theme as all my other object-oriented concepts, allowing the function box to become self-contained and self-reliant to build the functionality into the object instead of bolting it on later with add-on lists and macros. Object-oriented I.O. allows us to build the I.O. Spec specification and mapping directly into the function blocks, thus totally eliminating the restrictions and the maintenance of the CodeSys I.O. tree. I'm not going to go through last year's presentation except to briefly mention its content so you can decide if it's worth going back and viewing it yourself. It basically talked about the cognitive leaps one must make to grasp the concept of object-oriented I.O. And hint, one of those is, yes, you can survive without the CodeSys I.O. tree. It goes on to talk about the currently available techniques for configuring and mapping I.O., including the ancient direct memory mapping, the popular global variable technique, the CodeSys direct mapping technique, an interim step on the way to the ultimate solution, another interim step on the way to the ultimate solution, and then the ultimate solution, the complete object-oriented I.O. solution. This is where you treat I.O. modules like you do any other piece of equipment in your plant or factory. So you will now have a function block type for every type of I.O. module you have. Then you will declare an instance of each I.O. module, just like you declare an instance of each of your other plant or factory objects your pumps, your valves, your motors, your proximity detectors, etc. I.O. modules are just another piece of plant equipment, nothing different or unique that requires additional training or expertise. Then you will configure your equipment to connect each of its physical inputs and outputs to the physical I.O. pin on the I.O. module you declared earlier. All of the I.O. for your entire plant is configured in one file, and that I.O. mapping can be reconfigured at any time without shutting down your control program. You no longer need to deal with the CodeSys I.O. tree, the millions of mouse clicks to configure your I.O., or create and maintain Excel macros, or some other outside tool to modify the CSV file you exported for each I.O. module. Just place your I.O. modules in your program, configure them all in one place, and you're done. Not only can the I.O. mapping be changed without editing the program and shutting down the plant, I.O. modules can be dynamically added without editing the program, shutting down the plant, or even involving the CodeSys IDE at all. Now the production variations in your machine can include different sets of I.O. modules. And since you now have an instance of every I.O. module in your system, you can create a visualization for every I.O. module and view the status of that module, the state of each I.O. point in that module, and you can override the inputs, force outputs, and even see where each I.O. point is mapped to in your program. I'll show you a demo of that uh, when we get to the live demo. And the only drawback to this approach is that the I.O. vendors or third party must create function blocks for accessing their I.O. This has been done for all the Modbus devices by a company selling this product on the CodeSys store. We are still waiting for some I.O. vendors to provide the function blocks to do that for other types of I.O. and protocol. So let's look at the ultimate solution and how it would appear in practice. This is a design for the automation of a large racing sailboat. It includes some high services, some hydraulics, some winches, cylinders, and I.O. modules. Pushing into the cylinders, we see all the instances and variations of cylinders used on the boat. Pushing into the I.O. modules, we see all the I.O. modules of several different types. The I.O. mapping for the entire project is done in one centralized CSV file. In this case, the position underscore FI field input for the Genoa stay sail is mapped to pin 5, port 2 of I.O. module 12. Follow this pattern to map all of your I.O. You don't need to find and open a file for each I.O. module. This is a single point of information for all of your I.O. Just place your equipment objects, both your traditional plant equipment and your I.O. modules. Configure your equipment, including the I.O. mapping for each piece of equipment. Place and link your I.O. visualizations, and then you're done. And you could actually take this one step further and have your sales IT system perhaps automatically generate this file based on the bill of material the customer has purchased. 
And here's another variation of the way the system could be designed to configure your I.O. This one is where the equipment specifies the I.O. type and engineering units it requires. So for instance, this motor control needs a speed field output, and that output must be an analog output, and the units that it will output are in RPM. The equipment needs are then copied to the I.O. configuration CSV automatically by the system, where the provisioning engineer will specify how to deliver those requirements. They specify the mapping to the I.O. point, the scaling needed to accommodate the required engineering units, and any other I.O. configuration necessary. For instance, if it was universal I.O., then you'd have to specify, you know, if it's an analog input or an analog output or discrete input or, or so forth or so on. So your provisioning engineer will get a CSV file listing all the I.O. ports the system needs and what engineering units each point requires. This engineer then assigns the I.O. points and other configurations, scaling in this case, to deliver those requirements. This is a great perfect division of labor, with each object providing the information that it is germane to it. Object-oriented I.O. is very flexible. If you prefer the I.O. mapping being in the equipment as in the version we previously saw, that works. Or if you prefer this version, it works. Either way works. So let's see how this looks in a live demo. Now here we have a very simple factory demo. First notice that it does not have a Coates' tree at all. Instead it has two I.O. module types. Now in a real plant there would be one of these for each I.O. module type in your plant. You know, brand X, model Z, brand X, model Q, whatever. One of these for each type of I.O. module in your plant. Now notice this plant has uh, some equipment and in that equipment it has two pumps, and the pumps are instantiated and called just like you would expect them to be. But what's different here is we also have four I.O. modules instantiated. Module 1, Module 2, Module 11, and Module 12. Two analogs and, and two discretes. So instead of using the I.O. tree, we just instantiate these I.O. modules just like any other piece of equipment. They are a piece of equipment in your plant, so why not treat them as such? And then we can push into these, and then here we, we call the four different I.O. modules. The I.O. mapping is all done through variables, so we can set the variables via OPCOA or programmatically or via a visualization or any way a variable can be set. For this demo, we'll use the ControlSphere CPP library to set the variables and configure our I.O. via CSV files. So first we'll look at the I.O. supplier parameters. Now the I.O. supplier are your I.O. modules. So this is how we configure the I.O. modules. So here we have the four modules you saw earlier, module 1, module 2, Module 11, Module 12. We have a different section in this file for each type of I.O. module. The analog modules in this section, the discrete modules in this section. And each one of these modules has an IP address and then a logical name for that port. And there's one of these for each port. This is a physical name and uh, then a, the logical name and its configuration the logical name for the next port, and its configuration, and so forth. And now, if this were a um, local I.O., you would have a slot number here instead of an IP address. This file shows how the object-oriented I.O. central service knows what I.O. resources the system has available. Next, let's look at the I.O. user parameters configuration file. So this, this is where the I.O. users specify what I.O. connections that they require. So here we have, again, a section for each type of equipment in your plant. This plant only has pumps, so we only have the one section. And it has each pump that's been declared, pump 1, 
and pump 2. And each pump has these I.O. requirements. It needs a discrete output for the run command to go to the pump. It needs a discrete input for the running signal to come back from the pump. We need a speed command to command the pump at what speed to run. And then we need a analog input to, to uh, feed back the actual speed. And then these are the I.O. mapping for each each of those requirements for each of those pieces of equipment. And these are the same names that you saw uh, served up earlier in this other file. So module 11, port 0. Somewhere in here we're going to find module 11, port 0. So that's going to map to this first port of this module, module 11. The entire mapping of the entire plant or factory can be specified in this one file. But the, but the point is, it's all in one file. Your entire plant is configured, the I.O. for your entire plant is configured to this one place. It's a one point of truth. Uh, you're not spread out trying to do it in each little uh, section of the device tree, each I.O. module individually. It's one, one, one place where your, your entire uh, I.O. is mapped. Okay, so now we can go online. But due to a peculiar behavior within CodeSys, we're going to have to do a warm reset. You'll see we'll get an error message that indicates that the one of the configuration files has not been able to be read. There we go. And that is because uh, CodeSys has a peculiar behavior in that it does its initialization, and then it downloads the configuration files. So it, uh, so it, down, it downloads these files after the initialization. And so when it starts, the first time it starts, those files aren't there. So what we need to do instead uh, is we just need to do a warm reset to, uh, to now reinitialize once after these files have been downloaded. Okay, so here's a model of our plant. We have on the left the control for the pump, pump one and pump two. And on the right we have the IO modules. And then we have a simulator that's actually simulating the pumps. So the first thing we'll do is read in the IO user parameter CSV file that we showed you earlier. And then we'll tell it to update the ports. And then the mapping that was indicated in that file is, is done. So here we have the speed command FO is mapped to module 1 port 0, just like we showed you in that the CSV file, and so forth and so on. And then everything works as you'd expect it. We can start the pump. We can uh, change its uh, speed requirements. We can start the second pump and uh, change its speed. And then we're seeing the speed, the feedback come back with the speed and the indicator light come back with the speed and we can shut them off as well okay so now let's uh, just for fun let's read in a different csv file <clears throat> the swap csv file so this is identical to the the uh, io user read parameters except that the two pumps have been swapped uh, so we can read that in and we tell it to update our io points and now notice that the speed command fo is now connected to module 2 port 0. So our two pumps are swapped. So here we start this the upper left hand pump and that actually starts the bottom right hand pump and vice versa. Notice when we did that the IO was immediately redirected according to the new configuration file. So no new download is required nor is an online change required the new mapping takes effect immediately. We could go back and add new I.O. and add pumps to the original design, bring them in with an online change, and then they would work on the fly. No need to change the I.O. tree or perform a new download. It all could happen on the fly. The OOIO library also allows a single variable to drive multiple outputs. So we can turn on a pump with uh, one variable. So here this pump control is turning on and off both pumps. Uh, the, everything else is still independent, but uh, there's just this one 
variable is driving two I.O. modules. And we can do the, uh, the opposite as well. We have one output module drive two variables. So here we're, we're the status command. So here we're stopping. And even though this pump is still running, uh, this indicator light indicates that it's off because it's getting its signal from here. Now, why would you want to do that? Uh, you know, you'd never do that on a pump like this, but it just it shows you the power of object-oriented I.O. So do you remember I told you about the cool I.O. module visualizations that can be created once your I.O. module is an instance of a function block? Well, this screen isn't an example of that, but it does show you what can be on such a visualization. So first with this, we could change the ma I.O. mapping on the fly if we wanted to re remap a port. Uh, plus, uh, you know, we could save these changes if we wanted to, uh, and then later recall them if we, if we want. Restore those back, back again. Plus, we can choose what we want to view on this screen. So currently, we're showing the, the logical names. So this uh, module speed pump field output is connected to module 2 port 0. It could display the physical name as well. Now, in this case, they're the same, so it's not going to show any difference. But we could also show the I.O. type. We've got analog outs. This is an analog in. This is a discrete out. This is a discrete in. We could say what direction we want. Out, in, out, and in. Or if we were interested for some reason, we could see what size they were. or you know, Any other information you want to display here as well. But probably what's more, most interesting is, so here we're currently showing the name of the variable that this is mapped to. So this port, let's go back to the logical name. So this port, now module 2 port 0, is mapped to the speed command FO. So we're showing us what it's mapped to. But we can also say, say what type of function block is it mapped to. So the, this is mapped to a pump function block. Or probably most interesting is what's the actual instance name of that function block. So here we're seeing that we're mapped to pump 2. And here we're mapped to pump 1. So we can see exactly where our I.O. is mapped by looking at the visualization screen for that I.O. module instance. So just to reiterate, at any time we could go back to the program add more pumps and I.O. modules, and activate them in an online change. It's that easy. No need to shut down the plant or the factory, or do a restart, or do a new download. Then we, manually, we can manually map that new I.O., or update and read in the I.O. mapping file, and the new pump and the new I.O. modules are fully functioning and ready to roll. Life is so much simpler without the Coates' I.O. tree. So, with object-based programming, adding a sixth carousel to your airport baggage system should be as easy as declaring a new carousel function block instance, calling that new instance, adding a new carousel visualization block instance, connecting the visualization block instance to the function block instance, and configuring your new function block instance. And that's it. No adding variables to the global variable list, no copying programs or visualizations, no modifying programs with new global variables, no mapping new variables to new visualizations, no adding items to the unit conversion lists, no adding items to persistence lists, no adding items to the log list, no mapping individual tags to the I.O. And if you're using object-oriented alarming, there's no adding items to an alarm manager. Alarms for the new carousel just begin to appear. No human intervention or manual processes required. No must, no fuss, no mistakes, no bugs, because you're reusing objects you have used and proven in the past. So once it becomes this easy to add a piece of equipment to your design, you have reached the grand master level of object-oriented industrial programming. So that concludes this demo. The demo is posted on the ooip-foundation.org website, and the prototype source for the underlying library can be purchased from uh, Control Spheres. Just email me for more information. And that's it for this presentation. I'm looking forward to your questions during the Q&A session, or feel free to drop me an email.